Hey guys, thanks for letting me uh, speak to you these couple of days. And it is a, I know I, I don't want to go on and on, drone on and on, because I could tell some stories about Dave. But uh, most of them are good. He's been a great, great blessing to me. And uh, we have prayed together, ministered together, and uh, cried together uh, on numerous occasions. And so it's really a thrill for me to be able to just speak to you. And really, I'm just... I'm just sort of unpacking my heart to you. I hope you understand that I'm not really, we're not cutting through a, a, a passage per se, lots of scripture just coming in to play, but this is that whole business of what, uh, you know, sort of the un- unleashing of the soul, you know, when the, um, when the psalmist said, come now all you who fear God and I will declare what he's done for my soul. That's, that's all I'm doing here and I wanna do that a little bit more this morning. I came across uh, this, and some of you have probably heard it before. It's, a, it's an anonymous, I don't, somebody wrote it. I don't know who did, but it's like, it, I, when we talk about playing the man, I, I love this poem. It goes like this. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns, with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed, then watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects those he royally elects. I love that line. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay, which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying, remember that line, while his tortured heart is crying, and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. Amen? God, thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak to these men for a few moments this morning. Speak into their hearts, speak into their lives, speak into their experiences, Spirit of God, through the Word of God, and maybe even a story or two, if you'd be pleased to to do so, and to help them to play the man in their own lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so yesterday I, I... I started off by sort of addressing your pride. I had a couple of guys saying every single point they interacted with, which is sort of a surprise to me because that's really not my intention necessarily. I, I, I know a lot of you are writing notes and I'm thankful that you're doing that. Uh, a few of you are anyway. I joked about that yesterday. But my intention is, is not so much for information but assimilation. That is that the Spirit of God would, would cause you to assimilate some particular truth and it's the same thing this morning. I, something would tattoo you. That's an intentional use of that word, by the way, as you'll see in a a few moments again. But uh, really tattoo your soul from mine to yours. Uh, I told you that if others perceive that you're proud, what? You you probably are. Uh, God will save anyone who comes to him by faith. Uh, And all around you are people who are longing for the truth. You'd never know it to look at them. The two guys I brought with me last night, they're not here today. One, a scientist, the other, a doctor. I mean, again, everything about them would say, oh man, they have got it together. And both of them were coming apart at the seams, absolutely coming apart at the seams. And um, I mean, I know a guy, I'm working with a guy right now. He's, he is so wealthy. He's so wealthy. Uh, and he, but God got a hold of his life. He said, Pat, I don't, I don't remember two years of my life. He's 34 years old. He goes, I don't remember two years of my life because I was so hiked up on drugs and alcohol. And, uh, uh, but God got a hold of his life and it's his mission to say, he's going to be getting with somebody tonight who's also made it big, but his life is coming apart at the seams. And he's going to tell that guy, look, that pot at the end of the rainbow, 
you're looking for, it ain't there. I've, al I've always said that the only people who know that money doesn't buy happiness are those who have it. And, and it's not wrong to have money, as long as you know it doesn't buy happiness, amen? But there are people all over the place. Don't be presumptuous and think it's only the down and out that are open to the gospel. Let me tell you something. Some of the most down and out people are wealthy people, are highly educated people. They're dying for somebody to come in and tell them the truth. That might be you. And God will do whatever it takes to get you into the center of his will. Anybody without giving, can anybody testify to that truth? God will do whatever. Raise your hand if you've had that happen in your life. God will do whatever it takes. You know, it, it might take, if you're Keith Carlson down here, it might take your, it might take you while you're, while you're smoking reefer, the place is just fuming with, with pot. Your, your mom shows up with a pie to give you out of love. That might be the thing that God uses to just sort of stop you in your tracks and ask yourself the question, what in the world am I doing with my life? I, I do love the word of God. I, I, I really do. Um, I'm grateful for that. Um, since September 6, 1982, there's never been a day ever. That's the day I guess, that I've left the home without reading scripture. And I, I tell you that not to pat myself on the back, but because I tell you, because I just know myself. I know myself. I desperately need God. And so do you. Can I get an amen on that? God blesses those who keep their promises. And we concluded by re telling you that God might, this is a good segue into these last seven points. God might break your heart before he expands your ministry. So here's the eighth thing I want to talk to you I, I, One of these is inverted. I'll get to it eventually, but... For you, those of you who are anal, you'll want to know which one that is. So number eight, if all you have is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is enough. I remember soon after becoming a Christian, uh, all of my friends forsook me. I, I could relate to what Paul said in 2 Timothy. He says, he says, at my first de defense, no man stood with me. All men forsook me, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I could boldly speak the truth. I had that very much experience. And uh, the sadness of losing my wife was incredibly intense. And, you know, as a pastor, I had seven children. Their ages were 14 down to one, just weaned from his mom a couple days before she died. And so I had to keep my composure best I could throughout the day. And when I put the kids down, that was my cry time. That was the time I'd read notes that were given to me. And, uh, and I slept upstairs, uh, or I'm sorry, I slept downstairs in the living room for the first month. I just, every time I'd walk into my bedroom, it would be like a paw would just come over me. I, it wasn't like I was, uh, I was a psycho case. I just, I, I just had a hard time being in our bedroom. And so I slept on the couch. And uh, I would weep. When you, when you mourn, um, you will weep. You don't eat. You lose weight. You, uh, you, uh, you mourn. You weep uncontrollably. I mean, I'm walking through a grocery store one day and I saw her favorite candy, a silly thing. And I could not find a corner fast enough to just get away. I just lost it. And um, so, because I missed her greatly. And uh, one night I was on the couch and it was the middle of the night. And I was just Weeping. It was like the, it was like, I mean, every night, I can still remember the first night I got through the night without crying. It was about a month. And I remember waking up thinking, I, I didn't cry last night. But anyway, in the middle of the night, one night, I, 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 I was crying and I, I sat up and, and I was sort of frustrated with myself. I've been like three weeks straight or whatever. And I, I sat up and I said, Nimmers, get a hold of yourself. And it was like God himself spoke to me in that moment. And he said, you can't get a hold of yourself, but I'll get a hold of you. I understand you're a mess, but I'm still here, amen? And the psalmist, I think, put it best when he said, who, who do I have in heaven but you? 
And on earth, I don't have anybody else but you. I have no one beside you. And when my heart and my flesh fail, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's my portion. So mark this down, guys. No matter what you have, no matter what you are, or no matter what you will go through, if all you have is Jesus, and sometimes that's the way it is, then Jesus is enough. And he will give you the peace, and you'll get the grace in the moment. And then God loves to make beauty out of ashes. He just does. it. He's really, really good at that. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure I'm seeing some beauty. I talked to one of you guys the other, uh, last night, and God has given you beauty from your ashes. My heart was broken. As I said, I had seven kids, and, I was, uh, and, and every time I go into that bedroom, this paw would come over me. But after about a month, I determined I'm going to bed in my own bed. And I remember the very first night, like, 30 days after my wife died, I go into the bedroom. I, I, got, I slept on my side of the bed. That's weird, but that's what I did. And I was sitting up in bed, and I was, and I was struggling. Um, and, uh, you know, God uh, brought Job's experience to my mind. Where, where um, You remember the story of Job? Remember the opening salvo there, Job, this righteous man, nobody like him, you know, God allows Satan to have at him. And the only thing Job had left was his life and his wife, and he wasn't excited about either one of them. <laughs> and his wife says, you ought to curse God and die. And then Job says, you speak like the foolish women of the land. Shall we accept good things from God? And shall we not also accept adversity? Have you ever read that? When I read that sitting in my bed that night, I heard an invitation from God. We're to hearken unto the voice of his word, amen. I didn't hear anything audibly, but I heard from God. Because it was like, I've given you so many good things and you've readily accepted those. Will you accept this adversity? And I sensed that it was an invitation from God to me. And I got out of bed, I got on my knees, I got on my knees on my bed and put my hands in a cut position. And I, I literally lifted him up in my tears to God. And I said, God, upon your request, I accept this adversity that you've placed into my hands. Help me to handle it rightly. Help me to be the kind of dad I'm supposed to be. And I'll take whatever else you got to put in here because this, this life really sucks right now but I accept it. That surrender was one of the most, if not the most important thing I ever did after my wife died. And when that happened, when I surrendered, I had a peace. And this isn't, the, you'll hear another thing like this here soon. And because God loves to make beauty out of our ashes. And unbeknownst to me, there was a woman a half hour north, and we put our nose together, heaven knows, but it might have been the exact same night that she was having the same struggle with God, whereby she surrendered, and she was a widow for seven years. God's exchange program, by the way, is found in Isaiah 61. It says God will, he will give beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's pretty cool, isn't it? But don't miss the last part of it because that's it. Love, people love the exchange part because that's all about you. God doing this for me, right? Beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. Bring it on, God. I've had the ashes. I've had the mourning. I've had the spirit of heaviness. Bring on the Beauty, bring on the oil of joy, bring on the garment of praise for me. But the rest of the verse says that we may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he would be glorified. Because whatever God does for me or whatever God does for you, 
in his exchange program and you like it, yeah, give me the goodies. If it doesn't glorify him, you've screwed it up. I've screwed it up. So be grateful. God loves to make beauty out of our ashes, but only so that he gets the glory. And I was reminded of that when God brought Marilyn into my life. That's my wife. I'd met her a couple of years earlier and uh, with my first wife after, you know, I asked her if she'd ever thought she'd remarry right there. And she goes, I don't know. What was she supposed to say? And, uh, but that was my only encounter with her. And then when my wife died, uh, hours after my wife died, and I mean hours, she died at 1130 at night, eight o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting there and I'm just, I'm just crushed. My kids are asleep. They've been crying their eyes out. And I opened my Bible because I knew I needed to hear from God. And it wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to, it, it wasn't like that, but I knew I needed to hear from God. So I opened it up, I was in Psalm 69, I was in Psalm 68 the day before, and it says this, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I'm weary from my crying. And I thought, wow, this is like totally where I'm at. And then I read these words. The psalmist says, he's praying this to God. Let not those who trust in you become ashamed because of me. And then, as if you didn't get it the first time, he doubles down. Let not those who hope in you become ashamed because of me. And I, I remember going back from the counter in the kitchen where I read that, and I looked up to God and I said, Lord, are, are you challenging me in the early hours of my bereavement? And God was saying to me, Nemers, there's going to be a lot of sympathetic eyes out there in the days to come. But those same sympathetic eyes are going to be watchful eyes. They're going to want to know what you've been preaching is really true. By the way, it is. Amen. God's still true. And so, and, and in that moment, in that very moment, a friend came over. We, we were a mutual acquaintance. Acquaint Marilyn, my wife now, and her husband, who was gone in heaven, had discipled this guy and his wife. They moved into our area. My wife and I picked it up and discipled them. They'd become close friends. He comes over, throws his arms around me, puts some food on the table and some money down and, you know, just babbles something. You just, you know, what do you say when you're one of your best friend's wife just died suddenly and unexpectedly? And uh, as he walked out the door, oh, by the way, before he walked in and after I pulled back from the counter, after I was challenged from God, Marilyn Swanson came into my mind. Not in a romantic way. I just, I, I distinctly remember thinking that was weird. And I just dismissed it. I'd met her a few years earlier. And within a minute, our mutual friend came in, did all that. And as he walked out the door, he said, oh, by the way, I told Marilyn Swanson about this and she's going to write you an encouragement note. And I remember thinking that. And I, I just, I'm still broken. I didn't think anything of it. And so over the next... You know, a couple of months, I received, this is 1995 before email and all that, I mean, was popular. And so I got 700 pieces of hard mail, 700 pieces of hard mail. Because I was a novelty. I was 36. I had seven kids. And, uh, you know, I, and I got, I mean, I got, I got mail from women, young women, older women, divorced women, married women. I had everything. I, I even had phone numbers in these things. But I found myself looking for the one from Maryland. And I couldn't explain why. And guess what? It didn't come. It didn't come. I never got it. So uh, uh, in, in September, uh, there was a Labor Day parade uh, in, uh, near her town. I was in it. I, I was in it with, I was sort of a walking, you know, shell of myself, but wa it was a large crowd. And, and Marilyn called out to my daughter, who she knew through a homeschool thing, and my mutual friend, our mutual friend was driving the, the tractor and he looks over at me, he goes, hey, that was Marilyn Swanson. I'm walking this way, going, well, well, it, but I couldn't stop. He goes, hey, did she ever write you that card? I said, no, she didn't. And long story short, I w went to my office the next day and with sweaty palms and practicing my lines, I called her. 
And my opening line was, Marilyn, I said, this is Pat Nemers, pastor at Holmes Baptist Church. And uh, our friend Kelly told me you're going to write me an encouragement uh, card, and I haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> that was my opening line. <laughs> really suave. <laughs> I've gone way too long on this part. I apologize. Uh, that's, that, that was the thing that got us communicating, and, and, and you know, your, your ladies like this part of the story better than you, but God put us together as a result. And we've been together for 23 years. And uh, now we have 10 kids and 31 grandkids. Our lives are busy. But God has given us beauty for our ashes, and he'll do the same thing for you. You've got to believe that no matter what you're going through. Look, uh, more practically, uh, and number 10, you, you cannot claim your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path unless it is. This is... This is this is my mantra. Dave alluded to it. Uh, and to my knowledge, I have rarely made a major decision. I can't think of one major decision I've ever made in my life that I did not get direction from, the word, from God's word. I mean, literal direction. When I went to my first church, I remember, I remember thinking, I don't know anything. God, I don't know anything. I've been asked to go to a farming community. I don't know anything about farming. And I read in Hebrews 11, verse 8, and Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. That was, my, that was, that was God saying, you don't have to know. I know where you're going. And I went. And when I came to Sailorville Church, uh, I was wrestling with all things. I already said no. Dave, Pastor Dave was one of those guys I said no to nine months earlier. And I, but I got to a place where I just had to know God was clearly showing me it was time for me to leave. And I didn't know what to do because I'd burned all kinds of bridges. And I read in, and I was in Acts 16. I said, God, you've got to show me today from your word. What do you want me to do? I'm in Acts 16, the story of the Philippian jailer. I know this. I'm even literally talking to God. God, I know this story. I know, but would you show me I knew the story but I didn't know the obscure verse in the story that God was going to you know tattoo me with I, I if you remember the story he gets saved the Philippian jailer Paul goes to the house the whole house comes to Christ remember that and and, and then it says I think it's in verse 32 it says they come back and they go they say to Paul Paul the magistrates have called for you to depart now leave and go in peace. And it was like God just grabbed me like a rag doll and said, this is what I'm saying. I'm your magistrate. I'm calling for you to leave. Now go in peace. I went upstairs. I showed my wife and said, God just told me it's time for us to go. You know what she said? He didn't tell me. That was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but we worked through it. And a day later, two days later, Sailorville Church called me up. Unbeknownst to me, at the exact same day, they're having a discussion as to who they should circle back to. And long story short, they, the timing was amazing. Uh, but you can't say, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, unless it really is. Is it? You're not superstitious to believe that God will lead through his word. One of my favorite verses is Genesis 24, verse 27. The servant of Abraham, after he finds this wife for Isaac, and it's an amazing thing. Remember, he prays exactly what he prays comes to pass. And when he testifies about it, and, and in uh, Genesis 24, verse 27, it becomes a life verse for walking with God for me. Here, it's real simple. You can memorize it. As for me, being on the way... The Lord led me. Say that with me. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me. One more time. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me. That's, as for me, that's, that's personal. As for me, being on the way, that's experiential. That's the circumstances of life. The Lord led me. That's actual. That's God. That's spiritual. That's from heaven. And that can be your story. I want, that's, that's what I want my testimony to be when I got one foot in the grave and the other in a banana peel. As for me being on the way, the Lord led me. So let's move on. Number, actually this is, it, it's number 12 in your thing. I've inverted these. I will sit before the face of God before I stand before the faces of men. That's a commitment I'm asking you to make tonight. This morning, rather. I will sit before the face of God before I stand before the faces of men. Would you be willing to make that kind of commitment today? 
I've already mentioned that there's never been a day where I've left the home without, re- and that's the reason. I've got to see God before I see men. And no matter how hurt you are, no matter how distracted you are, no matter how busy you are, I don't care how busy you are. I don't care. That's the lousiest excuse. You're never so busy that you can't spend some time with God before you get busy. Get busy with God. I mean, the the Bible is replete, right? Oh, Lord, my God, early will I seek thee. My soul long for thee. My body thirsts for thee like uh, as in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. Early will I seek you. Jesus showed us in Mark chapter 1, he got up before, Jesus got up before the day to read and be with God, that is. Job said, I have treasured the words of your mouth more than my necessary food. Have you ever read that? So make that commitment. A few months ago, we, I was reading, actually, it was actually a couple years ago now. Uh, I was reading... And, you know, I've been having my devotions, my wife and I, side by side for years. And I was reading Psalm 61. At the very end of the psalm, it says, uh, I, will, I will sing praises to you that I may daily perform my vows. Did you hear what I just I didn't say this. God did. I will sing praises to you that I may daily perform my vows. And I saw the connection between, for the first time in my life, really, between singing and keeping promises. And I was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, which is really the sort of the seminal book on small groups. And Bonhoeffer, at the same time was in his book, was going on about how you really don't spend time with God and in his word. And you really aren't having a true time of devotion unless you sing. And it kind of bothered me because I've been doing this for years and I wasn't singing. I'm, I, I mean, I sing, but... But I saw that from Psalm 61. I saw that in the testimony of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It started making sense to me. And I read, and at the same time, on the same day, Hebrews uh, 13, verse 15, through him, let's uh, continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of our lips, right? Acknowledging his name. And all that was coming together. So, so that morning, I'm reading, and I, I got done reading all this. I said, my wife and I looked at each other because we often, you know, just exchange thoughts from our reading. And I said, okay, it's time to sing. And she goes, what? <laughs> okay, we're going to sing now. And I explained why. She goes, what are you, t- we're going to, you and me are going to sing? And we did. We sang, I remember what we sang. Great is thy faithfulness. Can you sing it with me? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. I can't hear you guys. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. You can sing this part. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That's what we sang. And that's what we do to this day. We sing kids' songs. We sing silly songs. We sing songs that make us cry. And then we pray. And we're convinced more than ever that we have to sit before the face of God before we stand before the faces of men. I apologize. I've gone probably too long here, haven't I? So, have I, have I gone too long, Dave? Okay. Uh, number 12, your dreams, if they include God, might not be big enough. I love this. So here's the king. Your, your dreams, if they include God, might not be big enough. Some of you just aren't dreaming big. Your dreams are that your kid or that your grandkid's going to be something special. What kind of a dream is that? Unless special means special for God. So here's a king, a young king, scared spitless 
of filling the shoes of his dad who's bigger than life itself. And God gives him a dream. And he says to the young king, look, ask whatever you want, I'll give it to you. So the king responds to God, I'll tell you what, I'll take, I'll take an understanding heart and an ability to discern good and evil as I lead. He could add whatever he wanted. I mean, he's like a genie out of the bottle. Solomon loved God. And God took his loving, desperate, and selfless request and expanded it beyond his wildest imaginations, didn't he? Actually, he, <laughs> he was dreaming bigger than he thought. A friend of mine played baseball for Iowa State University when Iowa State had baseball. And uh, he made the team. He told this story. It's a crazy story. He made the team. They made their way down to Norman, Oklahoma for his first NCAA Division I game against the Sooners. And he and his guy, he and his roommate were in the hotel room. We woke up that morning. He goes, I had the craziest dream. And uh, he goes, well, what? He goes, I dreamt the first time, uh, first time up the plate, first pitch, I hit the ball, sliced, went over the first baseman, landed into the right field, went into the corner, and I made, I got all the way to second base for a stand-up double. I mean, it's like, it was one of those dreams, like, it was really real. And uh, so game time, true story, game time, first time up to the plate, first pitch, you know what happened, Right? Smack, slices over the first baseman, lands just fair, just fair, into the corner exactly as he dreamed. He rounds first base all the way to second, actually slid, but he stood up like this, slapping his hand like he did. Just he could, he could hardly believe, like a prophecy. And he looks up, and the third base coach is going like this. And the, and the dugout's going crazy, and the only one doing nothing but sitting there with his legs crossed and smiling is his roommate. He said, Pat, I could have walked to third base. But my dream only took me to second. Your dreams, if they include God, might not be big enough. Why don't, you, why don't you have a God dream out of this deal? So after a million dollar remodel at Sailorville Church in 2004, we got 500 people coming to church, good sized church. What is the most spiritual thing a church could do? Build a gymnasium. Amen. Amen. The offering was so pitiful, I didn't even tell the church what it was because they'd been tapped out. I dreamed for a gymnasium. I'm sitting there muttering something on Monday morning, disgusted with the pitiful offering we had for the gym. And my counseling pastor right across from me said, well, maybe it's time to plant a church. I said, what? What did you just say? He goes, well, maybe it's, maybe it's time that we, we plant a church. And I said, that's exactly what we're going to do. I got on the phone. I called a friend of mine who had served underneath me, who I, I tried to get to promise to serve underneath me three to five years because he wanted to plant a church. He gave me a year and a half, and he bugged out. He's having success, but he's running up against all those traditions, you know, I called him up and I said, how would you like to come back here and plant a church? He said, would I? <laughs> My wife and I have been praying about it. I said, let's meet, let's plan. We met, we planned, and we planted Lakeside Fellowship Church with Pastor Dave Heister Camp. I wanted a gym. And five churches later, God says, your dream ain't big enough. I want a movement. And I would ask you to really give some thought, guys. What are your dreams? What are you dreaming? What do you want to do? What are you doing now? 
My dream wasn't big enough. No, no, it wasn't God enough. That's what it wasn't. How about yours? Think about that. 13, 13 here. Believe that some of your greatest opportunities to glorify God in heaven will occur during some of your greatest struggles here on earth. This is a big one for me. Believe that some of your greatest opportunities to glorify God in heaven will occur during some of your greatest struggles while you're here on earth. You know, if you have, if you have 10 kids and now over 30 grandkids, there's always a crisis going, okay? <laughs> I just want you to know that right now. There's always a crisis. Some are deeper than others. And uh, I had a daughter that uh, she was my most compliant kid in our home. Smart, got great grades, skated through everything. And she was a thief. I didn't know it. She was in Bible college at the time. Working for a judge. One of the most esteemed judges in the state who loved her. And he and his wife had given our daughter a credit card to use to just pick stuff up for him, which she did. And then she'd just add a little bit for herself and a little bit more. And she got caught. She got arraigned. She was facing big time trouble. I was sick to my stomach. Someone in church offered to fly me to that state. And I got in the plane. I wasn't feeling good, the pressure of it all, not knowing what I was going to do when I got there. And I, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's, uh, or Alex Metaxas's book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer had just come out. It was literally fresh off, the, hot off the press. And I had it. I brought it with me. I don't even know why I brought it. I wasn't going to read. Sat down in the seat, two women next to me, one here, one here. I just looked straight ahead. I thought, I, I don't feel good. I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to sit here with this book on my lap. And just as we were getting ready, just as we were taking off, the lady next to me said, uh, are you like a born again Christian or something? And I'm looking at her because she's looking at this book that has some kind of a subtitle about how God would use this man to, you know, for Jewish people. She says, I I I'm an Orthodox Jew and my daughter just became one of those born again Christians. Could you please explain to me what that means? In, in that flash of the moment, it was like God was saying, Hide it under a bushel? No! <laughs> the gifts and calling of God, Romans, right? Romans eleven twenty nine 29, are irrevocable. You don't get to revoke your gift. You don't get to shove it, put it under a shelf, shove it under the mat, stick it under the bed, do whatever you want just because you're having a, a, a trial in your life. And that's what God was saying to me. Oh, by the way, I wired you to talk to people about Jesus. Now talk. And I had the most glorious opportunity to talk to her about who her Messiah was. And then I met her daughter. She's born again Christian. Crazy thing. But all of that was God's way of telling me, and I'm telling you, that you have to believe this, that some of your greatest opportunities of glorifying God in heaven are going to happen during some of your greatest struggles that you have here on earth, if you respond rightly, right? So a woman comes to my office, Back, uh, maybe a year later, her, by the way, my daughter, uh, that, there's another story, amazing story. She's walking with God. I have an amazing story of how she got out of that deal, but I'm not going to share it with you here. 
But about a year later, I'm sitting there in my office and a woman's looking across at me and she's got a, her kids messed up and she's talking to me like, you have no idea what I'm going through, but you, ought, you need to help me. You have no idea what's going on with my kid. And she's talking like she's the only one with a kid problem. And I'm looking down on my phone and I see it's the principal of the high school calling me. And let me tell you something. The principal of the high school called me about three days a week, not because we were good buddies. <laughs> We'd become friends for all the wrong reasons. It was about our son, John. And when, I mean, it was one of those things, like Pavlov's dog. I mean, you know, I was like, oh, crap, you know. And I'm looking at this woman, and, and I didn't feel very pastoral in the moment, okay? I wanted to look at her and say, who do you think you are? Do you think you're the only one with an issue around here? But again, the Spirit of God spoke to me in that moment, in that very moment. I didn't feel pastoral, but God spoke to me. He, he just said, I know you're hurting right now. But this woman needs your help. Will you minister for me out of your hurt? And I'm telling you, this will keep you from becoming a sappy, whiny little baby like some men become when they get, when troubles come into their lives. God wants us to minister out of our hurt because some of our greatest opportunities are going to occur. That is opportunities to glorify God in heaven during some of our greatest struggles here on earth. One more thing and we're done. Your treasure of God is the measure of your trust in God. Your treasure of God is the measure of your trust in God. You trust in God? Do you trust in God? Do you really? I thought I did too. My greatest struggle, if I would be comparative, was not the death of my wife, though that was a great struggle. I think my greatest struggle was the death of my son, and he didn't die physically, but figuratively. Pastor Dave was one of those guys who prayed fervently. One of the other, pa I remember one of the other pastors in the in the Engage Network, literally crying, tears falling on the floor of my office, pleading to God for our son, John. God had given me a verse during that time, Psalm 63, verse 3, which says, your, I want you guys to listen to this. I'm, your loving kindness is better than life itself. Have you ever read that? Your loving kindness is better that's a comparative word, is better than life itself. Therefore, my lips will glorify you. And it was a reminder to me that no matter what's going on in my life, God's kindness to me, God, my relationship to God, my treasure of him is better than anything that life can offer. Do you believe that? Yeah, I thought I did too. So my son, John, took what my son Daniel did and put it on steroids, as I mentioned last night. He was not a Christian. Neither one of them looked like Christians, but John was really, really dark, super dark. And he was angry. He beat the crap out of a kid for no reason other than looking at his girlfriend, and he was facing jail time. And after a hard slap on the hand three weeks later, he did it again to another guy, and this time they threw him in jail for two weeks in a juvenile detention center. He got out, wore the bracelet, the whole nine yards. I thought, that'll do it. This will be the thing. But it kept getting worse. And one night, he didn't come home. It was a Saturday night. I was ready to preach the next day. I waited he was supposed to be home by 11, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, still not home, not answering text, not answering his phone. And if he gets caught, he's been told you're going to get thrown in a big boy jail. And I went to bed and I was just crying out to God on behalf of my son. Tears coursing down my side of my face and my wife not knowing what was going on. I didn't even wake her up. Oh, God, please save him. Please save him. And God spoke to me in that night 
and said, you don't trust me. I literally argued with God. I said, yes, oh God, yes, I do trust. No, you don't. You tell everybody else to trust me, but you don't trust me. And God said to me that night, am I not more of a treasure than the soul of your son? What if I don't save John? Will you treasure me more than the soul of your son? And I'm telling you guys, that broke me. That broke me. I lie in bed and I repented. God showed me that I had made an idol out of the salvation of my son. Was it wrong for me to want him to be saved? Of course not. Was it wrong for me to want him to turn from his sin? Of course not. But it had so dominated my life, nothing else was working because I'd lost the real treasure, God. I'd memorized the verse. I memorized the verse. I'm good at memorizing, aren't I? Your loving kindness is better than life itself. Therefore, my lips will praise you. And I repented that though I knew the truth, I hadn't really believed it. And guys, I'm telling you this, I'm wrapping it up with this. I recognized that night that the reckless life of my son was not about my son at all. It was about me. God was sovereignly doing what he was doing to my son so that he could get to his dad. And I repented, and I can tell you guys that God himself is my witness. I had a peace that just came flooding over me. It was like I got saved all over again. I, I went to bed. He didn't come home that night. It got worse before it got better. Just to let you know, it's not like the next day John came home, I'm saved now, Dad. No, it didn't happen like that. In fact, it, was, it got worse. And I wept a lot with my peers, my friends, my deacons, other pastors. And somehow they all saw in me in that time because of the peace of God that passes all understanding, that God's loving kindness really was better than life itself. I still had to deal with them, but I had something that I did not have previous, and that was peace. Amazingly, in God's kindness, after Daniel came back to the Lord, John was at a kegger and got into a fight with the guy who won the national championship for the University of Iowa. Poor choice of fighting. Got souffléed, broke his shoulder. And Daniel picked him up. He called his brother up. His arms, you know, sort of put in his own little sling. Picked him up, got in the car. Daniel looked at him and goes, what the crap are you doing with your life? Real eloquent spiritual line. That's what did it. That's what did it for John. John repented, placed his faith in Jesus. By the way, you know what we do at Sailorville Church with former drug addicts? We hire him. <laughs> He's on staff today, winning people to Jesus. Only God can do funny things like that. Oh, yeah, I was going to show it to you, but I didn't bring it. He's got a tattoo as well. Psalm 63, 3. God's loving kindness is better than life itself. Do you believe that? Would you bow in prayer with me right now? Just bow your head and pray. Just head down, think. Do you really believe that? 
I knew the verse. I did not live the truth of that verse until God broke me through my son. You know, God broke his son for you so that you might wake up and believe in him. Some of you have never really believed in the Lord. You've never really trusted him. You've never come to Jesus and trusted him as your Lord and Savior. And if you've not done so, you need right now in your quietness, seek forgiveness and salvation. And then if there's something on your mind, there's a child on your mind. There's your wife. And you'll just do anything to get your, to have your wife love you. But she doesn't. It's so hard. Not like you'd like to be loved. And if you're a teenager, you, you want to you wanna be successful. You want to have a girlfriend. How important are these things? Is God's loving kindness better than all that? Is it better? And if it hasn't been, would you right now just say, Lord, I, I have made my wife better. I've made my kid better. I've made my job better. I've made my reputation better than you. And no longer will I do that. I recognize now that my treasure in you is the measure of my trust in you. And I trust you today like I never have before. Will you forgive me? And help me to live the truth that your loving kindness is better than life itself. Therefore, my lips will glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.